Hey everyone, this is Hashem. Welcome back to Pushing Film and to another In Conversation video. And today it's with Kyle McDougall, a photographer who also runs a YouTube channel, which is how I discovered him. I've been a fan of his work for a while with all the insightful and helpful videos. And he recently launched his book titled An American Mile via a crowdfunding campaign with the help of Subjectively Objective. And it's available for pre-order for release later this year, 2022. So it was a great chat with Kyle. He had a lot of great insight to offer and I thought I would share it with you. However, the Skype connection that we were using had a bit of issues with video lag every now and then with the video component freezing up, but the audio was still okay. So I've tried to cover most of those moments where it was freezing up quite badly using the B-roll that I was putting over the video anyway. So hopefully if you are gonna watch this in its full length, you shouldn't notice it too much. But if you do prefer the audio only, I'm going to upload that as well. I also realized that not many people necessarily wanna watch through the whole conversation with longer ones like this or you may not have YouTube premium or whatever it is that you need to just listen only. And uh, if you're like me, I like to listen to these conversations while I'm doing something else. So I thought I would start uploading some of these conversations uh, starting with this one. So I will have hopefully put a link in the description of this video by now that you can check out if you want the podcast audio only option to just listen to the chat. So I wanna thank Carl for having that chat with me. I hope you enjoy it. And if you wanna check out any more information on him and his work, there's links in the description, including the pre-order campaign for the book, which is still available at the time of me recording this. So if you do enjoy it, please consider donating a couple of bucks to my Buy Me A Coffee page, which is linked in the description of this video. As you may have noticed, I don't have sponsors for most of these videos, so it would be greatly appreciated. And there's other links to more of my work and how you can um, help support what I do. So I hope you enjoy it and let's get to the chat. Hey, I'm here with Kyle, and I just want to say, first of all, congratulations again on releasing the book, uh, An American Mile, on crowdfunding. Sorry, I know it's not out yet, but the target was $13,000, and you've far exceeded that, and I think you're mm. at about $50,000, so yeah, congrats, man. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm overwhelming support for the book, which was, uh, yeah, I'm just so thankful for. It's really, really cool to see, see that. How does it feel to to finally be at this stage after what I'm guessing was years of working on this project? Yeah, you know what? It feels like it's exciting, obviously, to like bring the project together and kind of like put the wraps on it. And then obviously, you know, the excitement of getting it out there as like a physical object into people's hands and stuff like that is really cool. Um, and then it's also cool to like, it feels like a, a really... Like, it feels like it's wrapped now and I can move on to the next thing. You know what I mean? Not that I'm excited to obviously, uh, like, leave it behind. But um, sometimes, for me at least, it can feel like I just have all this work that's kind of, like, lingering, you know? And it's like, this is half finished. This is three quarters finished. This is a new idea. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of exciting, you know, to put the wraps on this. The book is going to go to production now. And now it's like, this is done. This is one finalized thing that's done. And... Uh, Interestingly enough, since this is wrapped, it's really given me kind of like the biggest creative like boost or inspiration uh, for like what's next. Just seeing how this kind of played out and then it's like all these little ideas I had lingering. Now I'm like, oh, okay, maybe they could turn into this next. So mm. anyways, yeah, it's uh, for a couple of reasons. It's pretty cool to see this this coming to an end. Nice. I know that feeling is kind of like um, that sense of momentum that you, you rub a band out of one project into another and you kind of... Um feel fresh again but that's uh great that you've reached this stage and depending on when people are watching this uh, i mentioned this to you earlier but can they still go onto the same link um, on your website to find copies of the book assuming it's still available and uh do you hope to keep producing a certain number of copies into the future yeah so it will still be uh available for pre-order probably same links and everything basically the crowdfunding campaign is over and anyone who backed it um, we, there was like uh, bonus prints that backers would get and maybe uh, something extra that we're going to add on to that as well now. But if someone wants to go and just uh, strictly pre-order the book, uh, no, no incentives as of, you know, speaking to you right now, um, that'll still be available. And basically we had a target, like when we started crowdfunding, it was to raise money to print X amount of books. Um, and then when we exceeded that number and obviously saw that, uh, dem like there was a demand for this and a lot of interest, we kind of like maybe almost doubled that number that we're going to print now. Because for me, like th with this being my first book, it was complete unknowns essentially. And obviously like, you know, I'm proud of the work and I'm excited about it. And I, I, I had a feel that some people liked it at least, but you still go into it having like no idea 
how it's going to go. And then there's also obviously like the typical artist self-doubt, imposter syndrome, all that kind of stuff where you're like, is anyone actually going to buy this? So uh, it's very much like a learning process. It was like we launched it in the first day we hit our target. And then that kind of told us like, okay, you know, there's maybe a bigger demand than we thought there was going to be for this. And then we kind of adjusted uh, internally from there what we decided to print and whatnot. So uh, yeah, it's been a huge, huge learning process. Nice, nice. That's definitely something we'll, we can um, come back to later, as well as that sense of imposter syndrome that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And it's it's great to hear that there's plenty of copies uh, available. So um, the book is releasing when? Do you have a strict time on it? You said the end of the year, roughly. Yeah, so before end of year uh, is what we plan for. Like every, at this point, everything's ready to go. And we've kind of like, uh, you know, we have production figured out and all that kind of stuff. So it's just a matter of, you know, hitting that number and, and now we'll go to production. But obviously there's like certain variables that are out of control or out of our control just with, you know, how things are right now. Oh, so yeah, of course. Yeah, definitely. These days, production. Yeah, yeah. Even, yeah. Even things like, um, yeah, shipping materials are apparently getting hard to find and paper and whatever. Um, yeah. But for anyone who's not familiar with uh, your background, I'm sure if they're watching this video, they hopefully are in, in some way or another. But just tell us a bit about your background, both in terms of photography, video and uh, YouTube, for example. Yeah. So currently I spend most of my time, um, the past two years have basically been uh, as a photographer and then creating work online with a YouTube channel full time. But uh, for about the past 15 years, I've essentially been working full time as a photographer and a filmmaker in video production, um, started out in television, then ran a, a production company of my own doing commercial work, uh, doing photography the whole time. But photography has always been for me like um, kind of like a side thing where like, you know, I did traditional landscape photography and then I've been doing this work. So it's, I've never been like a like a commercial photographer or a wedding photographer. Uh, and it hasn't actually been until the past two years where photography instead of video production has kind of become how I make my living, but not from a, again, a commercial standpoint, doing it now in this online space. So in a way I'm still kind of doing video production, I guess is like a, as a full-time gig, it's all a big mix, but yeah, that's what I've been doing for a long time now. And um, my photography, I guess, is like um, fine art, uh, landscape, uh, environment, like contemporary landscape. I don't even really know what to call it. Obviously yeah. working a, a lot with film and then I'm still doing, uh, filmmaking, mostly like documentary, short documentary character portraits and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Th those are fantastic. By the way, anyone who's watching hasn't seen them. I think I watched, um, one or two of them. And the, the one that I really loved was the, the guy who's in the bunker with the nuclear. Oh um, yeah. 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 Um, bunker thing. And you know, what's funny also is I was uh, recently looking up camera reviews or something like for Fuji X-T4 or whatever. And I saw you in a video that wasn't on your channel and it was like a, maybe a little oh, bit older. This tech. This tech. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And it was you and another guy like talking about the camera and um, it was like um, just a surprise to see. And, and it just shows that your, your background really goes into more than what you show on YouTube. And it is sort of like your core um Thing, video and then photos did, did really come later mm -hmm. but also in terms of the book how did uh, this transition into photography lead to the book like which came first because you said you've been working on the american mile for a while since 2017 if i have that correctly so that's quite a while it's five years and is that what really got you into photography or were you already sort of getting into it from then like how did this process of, of the book come about was it intended to be a book from the beginning or did that just kind of come later yeah. So uh, basically in 2017, I had been doing um, like landscape photography for like 10 years before that, but very like, um, very like, I guess, traditional is what you would call it. Like um, I, I, living in Canada, I had a huge passion for the outdoors. So I would do canoe trips and, you know, hiking and exploring kind of stuff. So I would shoot like, you know, sunsets and sunrises and wide angle stuff and all that kind of kind of stuff. But I, I kind of got to this major point of like burnout, lost my interest in that type of work. Um, and then 2017, me and my wife took off on a big, uh, like cross Canada, U S road trip for a, just under a year. Um, we bought a truck and trailer and lived in it and sold our house and stuff. And, uh, that was at a point where I was trying to figure out like where to go next with my photography and long story short, essentially got back into film, uh, again, after like a really long hiatus, I went to school for film, uh, like 15 years ago. Um, 
and then discovered some new artists that I didn't know about or uh, older artists, but artists that were kind of new to me and then started to essentially transition into the work that's in that book. So that project really was like this pretty big uh, period of change for me as a photographer, you know, completely changing my, my style changing the subject matter that I focus on, uh, the approach, the type of light I'm working with. But essentially, it was kind of just born out of this like six month period of like being so unhappy with my photography and like potentially wanting to quit that the only option left was to just like go and like play again. Like, you know, when you, you first start out and you have no idea what you like and you don't even like you, you don't know what you're doing and and that's almost in a way like really freeing like where you just go out and like shoot whatever and try things and like there's none of these like expectations or feeling like you need to create work for an audience and all this um that was kind of like a reset for me and getting back into that phase and getting back into working with film and then uh i would say like maybe six months of making that type of work and and uh you know it just felt like you know when you you start shooting something and it just feels very right like there's no you, you aren't forcing yourself to try and figure out if it's good or not like it just it excites you so that was very much what this work was and then from there it just that's what I focused on and it, it played a big role in kind of what I'm doing now as well um, so I don't know if that answered your question about the book but there at, basically when it started there was no idea for a book in mind it was purely just like hey this feels really good again I'm enjoying photography more than I ever have let's see where this goes and then the book kind of book idea you know started to kind of evolve from there essentially yeah no that completely makes sense and it i kind of had guessed that the the book was was born after this like sort of passion that you found in this um, visual landscape that you've been documenting and um like that's a pretty common pathway i think what you talked about with following this traditional landscape for example because i know that myself and probably a lot of people who maybe similar generation to us or whatever kind of follow the flow of the photography zeitgeist or whatever it could be like hdr mm. tripod long exposure stuff and yeah. then you kind of go through these phases and you first get a camera and then i think film really helped uh pull a lot of people back into that that uh, passion for photography so to speak and um you know i don't know if it's similar for people of a younger generation getting into it now if they're going to just sort of like go through film as a phase and then jump onto something else. But that's something I actually want to talk about a little bit later. And um, before that, I want to digress a little bit from the book and talk about your your style and having a sense of style and how you your work seems to have this visual consistency in the aesthetic. Even your, your more recent black and white stuff, even though it looks like a bit of a departure in that it's black and white, there's still a lot of similarity, you know, in terms of subject, composition and stuff like that. And um, there's a lot of consistency, especially in this series. You know, I'm looking at the the web's page right now, and you know, when the images are viewed on a grid, there's this like clear consistency that a lot of people, including myself, kind of struggle to to achieve. And despite that, and the fact that you know you you do champion film, you you do use film, you don't let one camera or anything be a necessity for achieving this consistency some people might think you know you need to use one camera or one kind of lens and um, some people do that with with great effect but you'll go on and talk about using medium format 35 mil um, even digital and kind of matching those digital files to film and how does that all play into it because it seems to me that you know the the camera obviously is just a means to an end for you Mm. but the consistency is important. Well, I'm happy to hear that because honestly, like any other artist, I look at my work and I'm like, ah, oh, there's no consistency here and this and that. So, um, no, but it's interesting to hear you, you say that because the one thing that I have realized, so one of the things that I struggle with is um, my attention jumps a lot. Um, and, and it's been a challenge as a creative because obviously I'm bouncing all over the place from thing to thing. And that's a big reason why, I've used different formats and this and that. And as much as I try, like, trust me, I'm like my next project I'm shooting on six by seven with Portra 400 and that is it. And then I'll like do that once and then I'll go shoot like six, four, five, and then I'll shoot Fuji GFX. So, um, but I think, you know, we, we all get wrapped up with these like tools and these film stocks and these like lens characteristics and we like break down these small little like minute details about like you know I, I like this lens because it has like a warmer flares than that one like 
all of these things that yes are things but in the grand scheme of things aren't really like what's what i've learned is what's going to have the biggest impact is just your vision as a photographer and how that develops over a long period of time and regardless of what tool you use and what film stock and and all that it's going to carry through because like when i sit down at my computer to edit photos regardless if i've shot them with Fuji Color 200 or Portra 400 or a Fuji GFX medium format or APS-C or whatever it is, I'm still like working on the image until it looks good to my eyes on the screen. Like, you know, and, and, yeah. and I think that takes me often to like a very similar point, regardless of what I use, because that's just what I'm after. But I think it's just these things happen naturally as well. Like it's not, you know, I'm not taking my like, you know, uh, film shot and putting it beside my digital while I edit my digital so I can make sure I'm matching the film. Like, I think they're just things that happen naturally because that's how your vision develops. Um, if that makes sense. So there, I think like there obviously are these differences between different tools and formats and whatnot. And I would love if I could stick to one thing, but, um, at least in my experience, what I've learned is like, yeah, it's your vision and how you approach your images. That's really going to have like the biggest impact all the other things are like little, little like ingredients, like little spices or seasonings, you know, but I think the, the, the kind of meat of it is just how you look at the world and how, what point you get your images to. Mm. Yeah. And actually that, that example, you said a C200, I'm guessing it might be referring to one of the images you posted on Instagram with the, the no vacancy neon sign in the yeah. window. And yeah. how you'd been shooting most of your 35 mil stuff for the series on the contacts. And then you had just a cheap point and shoot, like you call mm. it a crappy point and shoot with C200. And yet it's one of your favorite images, which says quite a bit. Yeah. And it's funny how that, like that literally was on this like thrift store point and shoot that I was just messing around with. It was actually like the first couple months of getting back into film. I think that was one of the only images on the roll that turned out, but, um, you know, it's fine. I wouldn't like print it 40 inches wide or something, but for a book, it's fine. And you know, the way I've edited it, I think fits well with the others. So yeah, that's, I think that that's a good example of how like, yeah, the tools matter, but they only matter to a certain extent. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm totally on board with that because I think some people do get to a stage where it becomes like more of an end rather than a means. And mm. they get too sucked into the world of like the gear and the camera and all that. And it's not to say that it doesn't matter because it does but it's it's the photography first and foremost that at least for me informs you know what I'm trying to end up with. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of this particular style that we see that you've probably only discovered you know through through time, it's not like you were just you just were born with this style and you picked up a camera and that's how your photos came out. But how was it? How did it come about? Do you think it was um, just through the process? Was it inspired, for example, by the some of the inherent qualities of film, for example, or, or others, other photographers, or was it just the way you saw the world and, and something that just was really organic? Yeah, that's tough to say because I'm sure there absolutely were like influences from, you know, other photographers work and stuff like that. Um, but probably stuff that just like, I couldn't tell you. Cause obviously like when I, um, was getting, back into film and, you know, switching up my work and discovering like, you know, Stephen Shore was a big uh, influence on me. But like when I would look at his work, I wouldn't look at it. I wouldn't go through his books and like study like, you know, the contra how he worked with contrast and things like this. I'm more so is just like so immersed in the fact that I'm looking at these images of these like very normal scenes, yet they're so like appealing to me. So it's more like I was getting sucked into like the, the, the the work itself um but not really like picking apart like i have a really hard time looking at images and being like where did he place the you know this subject in the frame and why is this composite like i have a hard time breaking down other people's work so but i, I think naturally when you look at work that draws you in you don't realize that it does probably affect some of the choices you make and stuff like that. But I think uh, with this body of work, a big difference for me was obviously the landscape changed completely that, you know, I, in Canada, I was in like forests and lots of green and working with like dramatic light. And obviously with that type of photography, everything's like, you know, pretty like bold and, 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 and strong. Whereas uh, I think just like working with film, working in the desert, you have like blue skies and, and essentially like brown 
dirt or whatever you want to call mm. it. And then you have these like little pops of color. So I think that probably played a role, but then also just like creating very different, you know, using like 30, maybe a 35 millimeter focal length as the widest I'm going to shoot with compared to in the past using really like extreme wide angle focal length. So I think all of these things add up to just like point you in a direction where they like influence how you treat your images after. So for me, that was like, you know, not a lot of saturation, um, not like heavy contrast, like really kind of like bright, uh, open shadows. But I think a lot of that too, just has to do with like the environment and how it influences you, you know, these open, wide open, hot, dry spaces, essentially. Yep. For sure. It, it, yeah, it looks fantastic. I'm really looking forward to, to hopefully seeing a copy in person, but, uh, what I'd like to hear, and I think a lot of people also who are interested in maybe producing their first book or zine or anything physical for that matter is, um, what was the process like in terms of any challenges that you encountered making the book happen? I know you've, you've talked about having subjectively objective on board, Noah Waldeck and uh, publishing company helps a lot, obviously, but were there any, any lessons that you could pass on to anyone who's interested in making their, their first book or zine? Yeah, I think like I, I've learned it, like this has been an entire learning process for me from like the way to go about a book to sequencing to like marketing has been a huge one because that is probably the thing I struggle with the most as a as an artist um but I think one thing that's really important that has actually inspired me recently I was talking about you know wrapping this up and feeling really inspired to go for my next one is one of the things I struggled with often while making while starting to decide to make this a book is I always just felt like um well, this project, like it, it, it's kind of just like evolved. Like it came out of like finding something I really like to shoot and just like going out and exploring and making work. Like it, I really struggle with the fact that like, I didn't plan, like, this is what it's going to be about. And this is what I'm going to shoot with. And this is how long it's going to be. And, and even as I was wrapping this project up and thinking about what to do next, I started to approach it like that, where I was like, oh, my next project is going to be about, uh, these three towns in South Wales and the theme of it is going to be the uh, impact of uh, in, like industry remains in the landscape and like just getting so complex with things and trying to like really formulate and structure something before I even started doing work. Um, and it, through working with Noah at Subjectively Objective, he was the one who was like, you know, this is a collection of essentially like your vision, your the way that you see the landscape of this particular area. And that can be something like, uh, you know, he even told me, he's like, often I'll get people who submit work to me and then they'll submit like, um, you know, they'll, they'll kind of like give me a synopsis of what it's about. And often that really changes the way I see it, um, which could be a good thing or could be a, a bad thing, I guess. But uh, I guess where I'm going with this is like, the best piece of advice that I could give is like, just start going and making work and seeing where that takes you. And don't worry too much at the start about trying to completely shape something that might not even exist yet. So um, where I'm at now is I'm like, oh, maybe my next project doesn't have to be this really drilled down specific thing about X, Y, or Z. Maybe I can just start going and photographing the British landscape and then a year from now, see what that looks like and go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think... Um you kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, your conversation with Noel Waldeck on your podcast, mm -hmm. the contact sheet, which I found extremely inspiring. Like he's obviously had, you know, he has a wealth of knowledge from curating people's work and being in this field for quite a long time. So I would also recommend to anyone listening who's interested um, in making a book to, to go back and listen to, to Kyle's interview with Noah, because that's a great one. So one of the next things I want to talk about, and this is, um, coming away from the book again, it's something that I thought would be interesting for us, particularly because we both have YouTube channels and, uh, and this really plays into doing something like selling a book or a zine. The fact that we have a platform and I'm kind of calling it the, the platform advantage, right? So even for me, um, I released a, a little zine not long ago, but the way I look at it, and it's a little bit this, uh, of this imposter syndrome that you talked about before was that I didn't think anyone would be interested, anyone would buy the book, but the fact that I have the YouTube channel and the attached audience on Instagram is what really led to me, you know, being able to sell 
you know, the amount of copies of the book, the, the zine, sorry, that I did. And it's not to say that it's an unfair advantage because obviously there's no. work that, that went into doing this. You know, I've been doing YouTube videos for five or six years or whatever, and you've put so much into building the platform that you do have, but it still can't, you know, deny the fact that having this platform is really important. And it is something mm -hmm. that, for example, with your crowdfunding campaign would have played into it. And it's something that you see a lot now in, in this kind of, it's almost like a, a new frontier of um, photography and of, of media production is that if you build a platform on social media specifically, it'll really open up a lot of doors. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I know how I feel about that. It's fine, you know, because like I said, a lot of work goes into it. But what do you think for people that might not have that platform, for example, and some of the challenges? And, you know, I look at other photographers whose work might be, you know, subjectively, I think a lot better than mine, but they they can't get it out there or they release a little book or a zine and it's sort of a struggle. What can people do to kind of um, to, to navigate that landscape and to, to overcome that challenge or to maybe just try and build a platform? Yeah, so I'll try not to go on for too long about this, but I have some thoughts for sure. This is something I think often about because um, I see this, I'll see this from time to time where like people focus on the details to do the thing. Like, for instance, people will want to start selling prints as a photographer and they'll focus on like uh, what print website should I use? How many copies? What should the pricing be? I need to take product shots of this and that. And then they'll put them up and, and maybe they won't have much success selling prints or books or whatever the example is. And I think like, even though the landscape has changed for sure over the past five, five, 10 years, whatever you want to call it, with social media, all that's really happened is it's opened up way more opportunities to be able to create or not create, to build an audience as an artist. And Yes, the way you do that has changed in terms of like the tools and online platforms and stuff, but like so many of the same things still uh, exist. Like really for me, this online world just gives me an opportunity to basically share my work, but even more importantly than that, like try and help other people. And for me, that has always been my focus it's never been like, oh, I want to start an Instagram account so I can just strictly post my photos and have people swarm in because I'm so amazing, which is obviously not the case. <laughs> like, mm. um, and I agree with you. There's, it's, it's not about being the best. It's not about having the best photos or the best images. Like that is not how it's not as it's not that easy. That's not what the point of building an audience should be. It should be, um, you know focusing on how you can help other people. So my approach from the day I started my YouTube channel was just like, I'm getting back into film. I'm going to make videos about stuff I'm learning and try and answer questions that I have right now. And hopefully this will help other people. And that's kind of been my goal throughout my, my YouTube channel the entire time. And I'm sure it's very similar, you know, just, I see the content you make and a lot of it is, is these things like either educational or, or like, you know, I don't want to say theory, that sounds really like academic, but you know what I mean? Like stuff that is going, there's going to be something in it for someone. And I mm. think naturally, if you start doing that, you'll, you build trust with people, you build connection with people. And that's how you build this audience of people um, who are interested in what you're, in what you're doing. So, um, you know, my book did really well and I'm incredibly thankful for that. But um, I, I think there's probably a lot of people who bought it. And I, and I know this just based off of some of the mess messages that people sent me who are like, I ordered it instantly. Thank you for everything. Like all of the work you've done, you've helped me out so much with film over the years. So I'm sure there's some people who bought it. I would like to think because they enjoy the photography in it, but yeah. I think there's a large group who bought it because they maybe wanted to, uh, support me after you know some of the stuff that i put out over the years I, I, I hope this isn't coming across the wrong way i don't want to make it sound like i'm creating all this amazing value for everyone but i think the point i'm trying to get across is like um the point of social media and the point of building an audience should be to build trust and connection and help other people that should be the focus in my opinion and i think when you do that that is how you build an audience and that is why people will want to buy your stuff and uh, I think often that's where, you know, people who 
might have amazing work, but are having a hard time selling it, that could be the problem. Like it's, there's so much out there. There's so much good work. There's so many people online that your tactic can't just be, I have good photos, so I'm just going to post them and they're good. So people will like them. And then everyone's going to buy my stuff. Like it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work like that. And, and I often will think about this for like things outside of photography, you know, the brands I like, you know, the things that I'm interested in isn't simply because I just saw it one day and I was like, that's amazing. You know, I want to give them all my money or whatever. It's these like brands that have good values or, or, or that are, you know, putting things out that are helpful or these people who I really like their approach and their thoughts and their process. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I guess the point I'm trying to make is like, I, I think, um, we all have this amazing opportunity to like provide a lot of value and, and make this photography community uh, even better than it already is. And I think when your focus is that and your focus isn't just on like, follow my stuff, buy my stuff, here's what I have for sale now. Um, I think naturally you just build this, you know, community of people that are like all in it for the same reasons and then willing to support you at some point, which is really cool. Absolutely. I, I agree 100%. And, and none of that was, um, you know, in intention to take away from the great work that's in this book or to say that any of it's undeserved in any sense whatsoever. I just think it's an interesting paradigm now that we live in with, with you know, the like you said, the way things have changed. Like 20 years ago, someone could have been like um, an amazing photographer and that would have been enough really to, to be seen through the very limited channels. Mm -hmm. um, whereas that same person now, like you, you wonder like if um, they had started now and ignored social media, would they have gotten as big as they did? Um, some of our contemporaries, including like Stephen Shaw, anyone who's like made some amazing work. Uh, but yeah, it is different. And and especially in this world of YouTube, you know, you, you look and you, you want to feel that relatability, which is what you were just saying. Like when I look at your channel, I do feel that that genuine sense that you're just wanting to share your experience. It's not just the cash grab. It's not just that you're trying to, to sell a preset and that's all it's about is that you're mm -hmm. genuinely interested in the subjects that you're, you're shooting and you're sharing through this work. And the same thing with any other channel, you know, like I might watch Matt Day or someone like that and we might have some kind of shared interest and sense of relatability because he shares a bit of himself especially and then you have like, um, you know, Willem Verbeek or someone a bit younger than, than me, for example, who has released a book, but then he might appeal to a slightly different audience, even though it for might sure. cross over a little bit because, you know, he shoots film, but that's what people want. They want that sense of relatability. And if you can use that to your advantage by building a platform, I definitely think it can pay off. And it kind of leads me into this um, next point in that because of how much things have changed now, you know, it, it seems like being a specialist in one thing isn't really enough. You have to kind of adopt this, um, I would call it like a generalist sort of um, skill set. For example, just being good with the camera is one thing, but then being able to market yourself, being able to, to play the social media game, being able to, you know, work hard on, on other things, like whether it's a podcast or a YouTube channel and then learning video and then within video there's all these other things and all that do you feel like that's actually another changing thing within this landscape like having to be more generalized um it, like it is for sure just yeah i mean if you think back 10 years ago um just even with the technology we had and the and how we communicated so I, I, I say yes hesitantly because i still think it's really important and this is something i need to tell myself all the time to not try and do it all. You know, mm -hmm. I think like, yes, like there, there are a lot of things that are easier um, now than they ever have been to kind of take on yourself again, just with technology and the advancements and things we've had. But um, I think where, like when and where possible, if you can get some help with other things, that's always, um, that's always, you can benefit from that as well, because mm -hmm. uh, it can, it, I mean, I'm sure you can relate, but like, I, I've only been doing social media, like YouTube full time for two years. I've had my channel for like five, but the past two years for me as a creative have been the like strangest and craziest of my entire, uh, full time work. And I've never experienced so many ups and downs just because like, um, yeah, connected all the time, you know, putting stuff out, trying to figure this out, wearing a million different hats. So, um, 
so yeah i i think like yeah we are all becoming a little bit more i guess like generalists and we are able to take on more than we have been in the past but i still think it is good if you can find some sort of balance like for example this this book um very much would have been something that in the past i would have been like i'll just self-publish it and then i'll like but it made such a huge difference working with a publisher who is like taking care of these like major things and i don't i don't know if we'll talk about that later so um yeah i think it's a balance yeah absolutely and i get what you're saying in terms of you don't want to um, spread all your efforts, you know, too thinly. And obviously if there's something that, you know, is just completely out of your league, whether it comes to publishing and, um, book design, it's, it's always good to employ the help of others, but it's, it's more in the sense of, you know, these skill sets, like for example, even you said you've been doing YouTube full time for two years, but that's born out of the fact that you had all this experience in video and then that helped for sure. Yeah. And then you're, you're learning audio as part of that. And then it kind of means that, you know, let's say someone was, um, really good at playing guitar and they're just able to just like shred um, on, on the fretboard. But then there's someone who's not as good at playing guitar, but they have this charisma, they dress cool, they know how to have mm -hmm. stage presence, they have all that, that package. It's all kind of related. Whereas, you know, uh, that same guy who might be as good as like Beethoven right now, he couldn't maybe be as popular or famous. He would need to have like charisma and a personality and be able to sell it and market it and have some kind of appeal. Because I see that in a lot of really talented photographers and their their following, for example, might be really small. And I wonder if it's sort of like yeah, because of limiting yourself to just one particular skill set, even if it's just adding the other um, really important skill set of communicating it through social social media, for example. Yeah, I think, I think absolutely there's truth in that for sure. Um, and it's, a, again, like it, I will say the one thing I, I do have this like experience obviously in video production and that helped me just be able to start making videos. I had gear, I knew what I was doing, but there are times where I'm like, I almost wish that I didn't have this like background in filmmaking because some of the traits that I'm bringing over with me aren't helpful, you know, like spending an extra entire day to like color grade my youtube video better probably is not a good idea <laughs> like people, maybe it is man <laughs> no 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 yeah. people i think what i have learned at least is yes sure quality is is a good thing um and like production value is a good thing and all that but what matters most is just like the message you're putting out and then just how consistent you are and i've had so many ups mm -hmm. and downs i just actually so i'm currently writing my first youtube video that'll go up in, in the past almost three months uh, other than the book launch i did i, I took i sh i was doing um three to four videos a month and i just shut my channel down for three months um because i just got well for a number of reasons but i guess like that like what i've learned over this period of time too is like just consistency putting your message out there delivering all the time that is so uh so important um and then all the other little things matter as well but maybe not as much yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, I, I agree in that sense. And it's also just for anyone who wants to take up, you know, photography and keep improving where I'm coming at is that you kind of like, you don't need to just try and, um, get a little bit good at everything. If you're passionate enough about the other thing, whether it's like, you know, you want to start a YouTube channel or a podcast or get good at video is that if you pick those one or two things, you don't have to pick too many, but you definitely still want to try and master them as much as possible and mm -hmm. improve that skill set if you think it's going to pay off in the, in the future. But like, I've definitely sensed this like shift in the, in the last like sort of 10, 15 years since I finished university, for example, where it's harder to rely on just like having a singular skill set and then neglecting everything else that kind of surrounds it, that, that comes with it. Well, yeah, yeah. no, a hundred percent. And I, I guess it all depends on like, what you want but the way like i look at all of these platforms and the opportunities we have nowadays is as a creative if you want to go and like the days are gone of like like when i got out of school i remember being like what am i going to do now mm -hmm. oh maybe i'll try weddings and i shot like one wedding and i was like uh yeah this is not for me and then i went and i worked i did tv for like five years like action sports tv which was amazing but like there were at that point there was no social media there was none of this other stuff and when i wanted to start making something in my photography um, I started writing like a blog 
And then I would go and do um, big art shows and set up like a tent and with prints and all this stuff. And obviously those things still exist, but I, like, I would agree with you completely that like, there are all of these opportunities now and like more than ever, if you want to try and make like a living off of your craft, you can do it. Like you pick a couple of them and just commit and learn and start figuring it out and just like accept that it's going to be a little bit of a bumpy road, but there are so many avenues that didn't exist before uh, mm -hmm. to be able to make a living as an artist. And I think that's really exciting. You know, as much as social media, there's a lot of social media complaining. We all do it from time to time. Um, I certainly do from time to time, but for the most part, I'm just like, yeah, these platforms aren't perfect. And I think, yeah, we're probably all a little bit more connected than we need to be. Um, but I think if you can manage it right and balance it right, like it is this world that provides, you know, crazy opportunities that didn't exist before to make a living um, off your craft. For sure. I, I agree 100%. And that actually leads perfectly into the next point. And all I've written down here is that like, you know, we live in a media golden age kind of thing. Mm. You know, it's like the, the gold rush age where there is so much opportunity and, and it is really what you're saying. And it's kind of where I think I was coming from as well in that you do need to do the hard work and it's not all kind of like exciting, sexy stuff. A lot of it is just mm. boring behind the scenes, like writing the video, for example, you put in all this effort and like the production, the editing and just the grind of, of rinsing and repeating. And um, it makes me wonder, like, you know, if we were 10 years down the track, 20 years down the track, would we look back at this time and think, wow, everyone who was really doing this kind of stuff in this uh, day and age was really at this um, advantage like this, like, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be worse later, but we we had this unique opportunity. It is really kind of like um, a, a golden age. Like you can start a channel. It's like, imagine you can just start a TV uh, channel you know back in the day and you can't you need to have access now you have it all at your fingertips really no well it's funny you say that and like i think that is so easy to forget is like yeah yeah like i remember being in high school i'm like i'm so i'm 37 now so this was like a long time ago but I, it, it was a long time ago but not that long, long ago we're and the I same age I had, Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So you could probably relate to this. I had like a communications technology class and I remember like making graphics for like, uh, like the, uh, morning announcements and you had like little wheels and you're using like mm -hmm. VHS tapes and stuff. So like the thought, yeah, like a podcast, if you want to start, like you can just go and start a podcast, you can record it and upload it, um, to Apple or Spotify or whatever, or you can start a YouTube channel you could make a course for um, Skillshare. Like the, there are just opportunity. Like the barrier for entry is so so low. From I guess from like um like a financial standpoint, essentially, or like yeah. a gatekeeping standpoint. But an entry entry standpoint, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. But once you're in that door, you need to do the work. You need to like learn what multiple people might have been doing. Like whether it's the audio component or this, and you kind of have to have a knowledge that it takes hard work. Big time. And I think the most important part of it all, though, is just to look at it like, um, you know, you could look and be like, oh, I'm not going to make a photography YouTube channel because there's, you know, 4,000 other ones talking about whatever. I think the if you can just look at it like, here's an opportunity for me to provide some sort of unique uh, angle or share my experience or my unique traits whatever that is i think there's this opportunity for all of us to like add a little something that wouldn't be there if we didn't make it for sure that i think that's a, a great topic and something that i'll continue to dwell on going forward <laughs> but um was there anything um back in terms of the book before we we summarize that you wanted to share uh whether it's in terms of uh, you know the process of putting it together i know you mentioned a little bit about subjectively objective if there's anything more you want to share about that process uh, yeah. I mean, like I said, that played a huge role. Like it was working with Noah and having the opportunity to work with Noah, uh, was just huge because it took me out of the sitting down with, you know, 700 images and being like, um, like, where do I even start? Like I get overwhelmed quite easily with, with that kind of stuff. And like I said, my attention, I lose attention quite quickly. So, uh, you know, working with him, you know, narrowing down images together, Noah worked on, on the um, initial sequence and then we 
did iterations from there based on feedback and having discussions. But it was just the, this way to like, it was really cool to like, let someone else take your work who's experienced in like curating and sequencing and see how they put it together. And there mm. were so many decisions where at first I was like, oh, you like, you chose that image, you know? And, and then he would be like, oh, well, this is why I chose it. And then I would sit and be like, oh, that actually works well. But like, I never would have, I would have never picked that image because it can be easy for us, I think, to look at our work. And if say you lay it out in front of you, you'd be like that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, like basically picking your greatest hits, right? Like mm -hmm. what are the fanciest images that got the most um, engagement from people? But what I've learned is like, it's so important to have like diversity in a portfolio, quiet images that might not be like really exciting on their own um, can be incredibly important in the body of work. And when they're paired with something or sequenced properly can end up becoming something that you would have never imagined before. So um, that was huge for me. And then obviously, you know, beyond that, uh, just being able to have someone who's obviously made a lot of books before and who takes care of, you know, production and all logistics and all that kind of stuff. It allowed me as the artist to focus on kind of like the work, how it's going to be presented. And then some of the, de you know, the design, um, elements that, that we did together. So, uh, yeah, that was the first thing, like, you know, talking about wearing multiple hats again, I've always been someone throughout my career has been like, oh, I'll do all of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think there's positives in that, but often negative. So this was a, a, for me, a lesson to know like, oh, like moving forward, um, this is something I'd like to do more of, you know, collaborating with someone on projects like this. Yeah, it is a collaboration of sorts because if someone is, is curating the work and choosing a sequence that you otherwise might not have, like you said, it becomes a little bit of, and I think he mentioned this in your interview with him where he is almost equally, you know, having a part to play in terms of what the the, the reader or the viewer sees and how they interpret the series because they um, they play into that. And, sure. and you're definitely right. There's always a time and a place where you, where you have to collaborate. You have to kind of like um, fall back on the expertise of someone else and it's great to hear that. And I think that he even mentioned that um, he, he sees a lot of work. A lot of people do submit their work from, from what I remember, correct? You know, if anyone yep. can really go on yep. there. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, anyone and can submit their work. If not them, I'm sure there's a lot of other similar agencies. So it's a good uh, avenue to explore for anyone who's interested in going down that, that publishing route. All, all I was going to mention really quick is like um, the importance of relationships. So, if, yes. you know, you can go and sub submit to other places. Absolutely. And that could be a way in. But also just like I think as a photographer, always making relationships and you never know kind of where that could lead as well. So important. Even yeah. just stuff like this, like us having a chat, we don't we don't know what it might lead to somewhere down. For the sure. Track. Sorry, it's my my cat messing around with a pen in the background. If you can hear oh, it. Good. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about this is is no pressure, man, but I'm a huge fan of the Contact Sheet podcast, and I know that juggling all these things, as well as you know, you've you've moved countries, you've got a family, you've got so much going on, um, and it, it's taken a couple of like breaks. Is that going mm -hmm. to come back? Because I know you just put out an episode recently. Is it something that you're going to be um, putting a bit more um, time into soon? I would love to. And like, it's certainly not gone forever. But um, yeah, a lot has changed in the past two years. Obviously, I have a young daughter uh, moving countries. And it took me a while to like, I'm, I'm very much the person who's like, all this stuff's changing, but I don't realize it. And I'm just going to keep go doing what I'm doing. And then I'm just like, oh, this doesn't work anymore. So mm -hmm. uh that was a that was a part of why I had to stop. Obviously, uh, the contact sheet as well was has always been a passion project. Uh, it doesn't. It's not like a, I make no money from it, which is great. And that's you know if you can do that often, it's a good way to operate because. Mm. Um, but the downside with that is like when you need to free up more time, you got to focus on the stuff that um, is is part of the business. So that's I just I essentially ran out of time, but. Um, yeah, I would love to. It's something like out of all the stuff that I do, YouTube channel and and, and all that, uh, it's th like conversations like this and, you know, doing that podcast are what I enjoy the most. So, um, yeah, yeah I, got, I, ha I have some thoughts. Hopefully it'll come back pretty soon. Yeah. And I know what it's like. Sometimes like things need to take the back burner and they're not always just going to be, you know, infinitely possible to the same degree. And um, I know for myself, like when it when it was really coming out, I don't know if it was around 2019 or 2020, but I certainly remember that during the early days of the pandemic and all these lockdowns, I'll be on on a walk to the shops, you know, my my daily walk or whatever, listening to the podcast and really being inspired by some of the conversations you had 
because there were quite a few episodes around that time, I think, when maybe a lot of us were in lockdown and mm-hmm. that does open up more time to produce and to listen to things like that. For sure. Yeah. So what um, what can people look forward to next? Is there anything you want to tell people about? What are you working on at the moment and um, anything exciting you want to share? Um, I wish I had some like thrilling answer for you, but uh, no, honestly, it's it's a huge part of my focus over the last like six months has been um, not like what am what what am I going to make next or what's the next big project, but more so like how can I become better at balancing um, life as a creative and then just also personal life. Um, again, especially now with a, a young family and stuff, it's something that's really important to me. And uh, I, in the past, have very much been someone who's like gets so like sucked into like my work, you know, and like the art I'm making and just, it consumes me. So I'm trying to be, I would say my, my exciting project I'm working on is trying to be better at giving as much energy to things in life that are more important than my photography. Yeah. 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 That's fair. That completely makes sense. For sure. So, and that, and then obviously maybe that's a bit of a boring answer because this is a photography uh, channel that you run. Um, I'm going to be working on like starting work, like I said, on, on, uh, just like unattached making photos of England and seeing where it goes yep. and then just getting consistent with everything else I do. It's kind of my, yep. my game plan. Yeah. Makes sense. And it doesn't seem like you're in any, in any rush to kind of um, jump into a whole new series or make something out of it. But I have noticed, and I'm sure other people may have noticed that some of your most recent photography work has sort of shifted to this like stuff in England, a lot of black and white work, for example, maybe mm-hmm. trying some new cameras and new gear. And is that going to sort of just continue as it is for a while until you maybe figure out what you want to do with it, if anything? Yeah, I think so. I just went, I just got back yesterday from a, a two day trip and I shot color the whole time and I haven't, oh. I haven't shot any color really since I've lived here. So, um, yeah, like I said, you know, I'm, when I started that black and white work, I'm like, oh, okay, here, this is what it is and I'll title it and all this. But now I'm just like, uh, maybe I just need some time to just like make stuff. So I went on this trip. I shot some color. I did some portraits of some people I met and that sparked some ideas. So, uh, yeah, I no like set concrete plans, but, um, I could see a return to color and just like exploring the British landscape and maybe like a little bit of a similar way to the work from a, an American mile. I think the black and white stuff is like maybe a personal project on the side, but I think a lot of that was maybe born out of just like playing around and experimenting and trying new stuff, um, which is important to do. Awesome. Yeah, man. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next and looking forward to seeing, um, an American mile. So if anyone watching, make sure you check it out. It's on uh, carlmcdougallphoto.com. Uh, they can check out your Instagram. Is there anywhere else where they can find you and your work that you want to uh, direct them towards? Yeah, that's it. I mean, I'm on YouTube. If you want to find my channel in there, Kyle McDougall. Um, but other yep. than that, I'm posting mostly on Instagram and website from from time to time. Cool. Yeah, I'll make sure to put that in the, the video description as well. So thanks for having a chat, man. This was great. Sweet. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, good to talk.